I just want to say thank you to all the Cryptic Slaughter fans, uh, from the old school fans from that support us from 84 to 88, to the new generation, just all of you for keeping the Cryptic Slaughter name alive. It's because of you that I'm able to talk to you on this DVD. It's because of you that people remember the name Cryptic Slaughter. If it wasn't for you, we would be nothing. So I just want to say all my love and respect to you guys for keeping the name alive. and. I hope to meet all of you one day, but thank you very much, and this CD DVD is for you. Cheers. We got to work with Bill Matoyer, who worked with Slayer on Show No Mercy on the chapel. When we finished recording the record, he brought the tape to the president of Metal Blade, which was Brian Slagle. Brian Slagle heard the tape and asked Bill if there was something wrong with the tape, and Bill's like, no, why, what's wrong with the tape? He goes, there's no way that this band is playing this fast. And Bill just laughed. He goes, no, they're playing that fast. I remember walking in the store one day and I pulled out the Convicted record that just came through. Went up to the, uh, the counter and asked the guy behind the counter, I said, what's this like? And he said, think of raining blood but ten times faster. <laughs> Convicted was like the fastest, you know, thing I'd ever heard at that point. I was just like, man, this is this fucking intense, man. A buddy of mine gave me this tape with this band Crypto Slaughter on it. First time. I, I don't recall what song it was. I think there was like two or three spread out throughout the tape. And uh, it was the fastest, dirtiest thing on the tape. The energy the enthusiasm, the young angst. You know, to be honest with you, I don't know who the fastest band was, and I don't really think it matters. I just know there's a lot of great music that came from that era, and I, you know, I love it all. That's, that's really all that matters to me. Fuck yeah! If it wasn't for Cryptic Slaughter, DRI, and a few, few other bands, I'd say like COC. <laughs> It's just young kids playing fucking metal punk. And that's like, that's what I live for. Why? Cryptic Slaughter. ago, before internet, before mainstream media, 
there was a little thing called the underground tape trader scene. Back in the day, how we communicated in the underground was by purchasing cassette tapes and recording and shipping them off to different regions of the United States and all over the world. I think 1984 is when I stumbled upon the Life in Graves demo from Cryptic Slaughter. You know, this was in the, in, in the mid 80s uh, during the heyday of, of punk and thrash and hardcore. And we'd heard of the, somebody had the, I think there was a demo, Life in a Grave or something like that. And uh, so we were familiar with the band prior. So then uh, when the record came out, Convicted, we, we picked it up. And, you know, at that point, we were always looking for. Um, I don't know, when you're a kid, you're always looking for the most extreme thing, and that by far was it. I mean, there was bands coming on the scene at that point. Now you have to realize at this time, this is back in the heyday of when punk and thrash and, and, and hardcore was a united scene. You would have bands like Agnostic Front and GBH touring together, bands like Chromax and Destruction touring together in, in the 80s. So it was a, a magical time, but you know when you're looking for, for the most extreme thing, you know there were bands coming on the scenes, Vermont, I think, Sweaty Nipples, Splast, uh, Spastic Blur, but uh, Cryptic Slaughter, when we heard it, was just like, it was, it, even though it was fast and insane and, uh, and off the charts, the, the music was so catchy. Like the breakdowns, the little breakdowns here were so catchy that it just like stuck and it was something that we were fully into and, and, and been into it ever since. Let's go see for you. Jason Mantis, who had a fan zine called Pounder, and it was one of my favorite underground zines at the time. So, and he was a dude whose opinion I respected highly. Where I lived at the time, it was hard to find music unless I, you know, got it through the mail from somebody I traded with. But I remember one day getting a huge envelope full of, I think there were six TDK cassettes, each 90 minutes long, and it was like Christmas. I remember at the end of one of the cassettes, he attacked on the uh, Life and Grave demo by Cryptic Slaughter. And, and it really jumped out at me because I couldn't really categorize it as metal. I, I couldn't really categorize it as hardcore or punk. It was really fast and the 
song titles were all super badass. I remember, you know, Ward of the Knife and Life and Grave and Flesh of the Wench, and it really stuck out. Okay, this next song's also a new one. This was written when all the shit was going down with them. Uh, basically, the, the quickest way to become a millionaire and a bit of quick buck hey, is to become a TV evangelist. Shut up, Carl! You like know, Jim Baker? Yeah, he's a great guy. This one's called Circus of Fools. kids they came out to one of the shows we were doing and uh, I remember they were really enthusiastic and they were way into music and then they told us about their band they were called Cryptic Slaughter and I thought interesting name and I, I liked it because they combined some good names together so I was like and it's hard to forget Cryptic Slaughter so um, 
we kept in touch like we became pals and then we I think we exchanged phone numbers and we kept in touch and uh, we became friends and uh, that was probably the most important thing to me at the time just because it was another camaraderie with some guys that were musicians and they loved loved the music that we loved once they got things going and they, they finally got a demo done I remember one night we were at the studio I think we were recording one of our records I can't remember it might have been the first Hyrax record but I got this call from the drummer Scott and he was like hey you want to hear our demo and this is back when people would put the phone to their stereo and play stuff for you I remember hearing the demo and I remember the drums being fucking really fast but that was like my first being introduced to Cryptic Slaughter <laughs> Slaughter to me, like, I heard, I heard of him through a weird way, like, um, one of my really good friends, Power Violence Bands, uh, Blake from Pain Destroyer had a band called Daybreak, and they ripped off the Convicted cover, and, um, when I was young, I was this super big Power Violence fan, and they did the Convicted rip off and I was like, like what the fuck is that and, and uh, I had to research it because it looked cool as shit but they were like oh that's not our art like we, we, we totally stole that from, from this band they went and researched it and I was already like super into like gangrene like SOD and all that shit and then like like I heard that shit it blew my mind and I went and bought money talks like, I was, I was a soul Anybody fan. using a shitter? <laughs> Fender's Ballroom. Ask anyone who was part of the scene in the mid-80s, whether you were in the thrash or punk, you went to Fender's Ballroom for a show. And Cryptic was lucky enough to play there three times. Um, our first time we played there was uh, Add to Adjustment, then Us, Final Conflict, Dr. No, and Discharge. It was just rad to be at Fender's Ballroom. I remember being on the stage going, wow, I've seen the Ramones here, I've seen RKL and Bad Brains here, and now Cryptic's playing here, this is, this is fucking awesome. It's called Human Contrast. <laughs>
whereas a lot of the thrash bands had like a, a cleaner production, a cleaner recording. It, um, Cryptic Slaughter was just more, um, it, it sounded like it, the whole the whole thing was done in the garage, you know, and it was like uh, just real dirty. It was like venom sped up to me or something, and even though at the time I couldn't really compare it to anything else, that's probably the first thing I thought of. But uh, listening to that demo led me to get in touch with Scotty Peterson, the drummer, and we corresponded for years after that, and we're still friends to this day. I remember when the uh, Convicted album first came out, uh, and Money Talks, those were just two milestones in that genre of music to me. The thing you have to remember about Cryptic Slaughter is they came out of L.A. and there was nobody doing the shit that they were doing at that time. It's true. <laughs> it's true. I mean, like, you don't have to prod me on this. It's just fact. It was real. It was genuine. It was ahead of its time. And it struck a nerve, much like in the 50s with the early rock and roll pioneering acts. This is the genre of music which created all this here in 2015. It was raw, it was aggressive, and it was definitely real. Thank all you guys for coming tonight. Yeah! Supporting the scene here in Detroit. This next one's also a new one. Yeah, yeah that's me later. This, this next one's called Just Went Black. <laughs> Evolved independently of one another. You know, you had DRI in Texas, Cryptic Santa Monica, Wehrmacht in Portland, Siege and AOD back east, and, and everybody, we all had our own thing going on. I don't think one necessarily influenced the other. When I think about in 1984 and when we started doing what we were, we were doing at that time, there was never any possibility that Speedcore, Thrash Metal, crossover, any of it, was ever going to be commercially viable. If you would have told me back then that now Slayer would be like one of the biggest bands in the world, I would have laughed. 
just wasn't within the realm of possibility that this music was going to ever reach a vast audience. That was, in a way, that was terrific because we didn't have to adhere to any particular form. We didn't have to follow any musical rules. We could do whatever we wanted to. I studied music theory, but I threw it all out the window because it didn't fit what we were trying to create. We wanted to do something different. We wanted to do something unique. We didn't want to sound like anybody else. Wow. Hey, we're on film. <laughs> this is Cryptic Slaughter. And we've been together now for like over a year, almost a year and a half. And uh, we're going to play this hot party tonight. <laughs> and uh, my name's Les. And what do you Scott. play, Les? I play drums. Oh, I play guitar. Club. Scott plays uh, drums. Bill sings. I sing. And uh, Rob plays with his penis. I mean, he plays with <laughs> It's called Set Your Own Pace. Well, come on, you're in the pit. Oh, bad boy. When I think of those classic underground videos that were like Defenders Ballroom, and now there's one that surfaced, I think now where there's like playing in a backyard where there's people just smashing each other, like it's it's amazing to me. I, like that's the kind of stuff that we just we try to you know we miss and we we try to bring people together and and hope to to carry on the tradition of crossover music like that that's when I think of crossover music a band like Cryptic Slaughter is one of the first bands that comes to my mind uh, the reason I wanted to help Cryptic Slaughter is just because they were cool fucking dudes I mean that's that's what I think everything should be about you meet guys that are hungry and want to do music and uh, have the right attitude for me they have the right attitude because they just were crazy they wanted to play music they were trying to get shows going they would play anywhere they were they would play you know, at a, at a VFW hall, if they could rent it, you know, anything they could do to play, they were they wanted to do it. So to me, I wanted to support that, and also I thought that we should have some kind of a scene. And to me, they were an important part of it. They were new and they were young, and they were full of energy. So um, yeah, that's why I wanted to help. Them. I remember going to Brian Slagle, and I think I had a cassette of the demo, and I was like, "You got to check these crazy fuckers out. They're really fast." And back in those days, that was kind of the thing that kind of like. You know, how you tip somebody's interest by going, these guys are extremely fast, and they, they're probably the fastest band at the time. Slagle actually started a label called Death Records, and uh, Cryptic Slaughter got signed, and I was pretty proud. To me, to this day, I'm still proud that I helped them get signed to Me Metal Blade slash Death Records, but to me, it's still Metal Blade, but, but uh, kick-ass band, and they deserved it. Yeah, I first heard Cryptic Slaughter through uh, Mark Edwards from Guillotine Magazine when I was staying in Florida. Uh, Matt and I were down there, working with Death at the time. And uh, they had just got the demo and they played it for us. They had the actual demo with the cover and everything. They played it for us and it just blew our minds. It was like totally awesome, you know, crossover 
Um, and it was super fast and thrashy and trashy and we loved everything about it. So um, it definitely sort of gave us some ideas about going home and starting a new band that was, you know, even faster and wilder than what we were doing already. You know, as far as the speed thing goes, it was never really a conscious decision. And it, I think it really gets blown out of proportion. Certainly people like to talk about it. It wasn't in the forefront of what we were trying to do. We just sort of evolved into that after playing together for the first couple of years. It was fun. Playing fast was a lot of fun. It was like an adrenaline rush. And so the faster we could play, the faster we did play. Cryptic Slaughter is all, you know, everything they did, man, still to this day, you know, stands the test of time. I mean, I can go back and listen to those records and it's still just as intense and still, you know, like it, it's, it's more punk rock than, than what's out there, you know, masquerading as punk rock, you know, the, the energy, you know, the, the you know, the, the anger that, that, that was in that, that, that you don't get in like, you know, the, the stuff that's going around being called punk rock these days, you know, rest in pain. So I thought that was like the heaviest song that you guys did on that record and uh, too much, too little or something. Yeah, is that what it was? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, that song was awesome, man. I just love the way it started out all crazy. Ah, psych. And then it went in with the bass, man. That was killer. I just remember from the first song to the last song, people flying across the stage. Like some people on stage, I couldn't even see Les Bill or Rob half of the time. And, you know, huge pit and people singing our songs like loud to where like sometimes I couldn't even hear Bill and it was really cool because it made me realize like wow you know people really like convicted they really like us and this is killer that we're on stage and people are going this crazy for us and that's when I realized wow you know cryptic we have our own following we finally have made it those shows were predominantly DIY meaning that it was from the movement for the movement. What I remember about those shows, aside from just the adrenaline and the chaos and the madness, was just how free and how exciting it was because it was a brand new form of music rebellion with no rules whatsoever, which also included uh, a bad element at times, but that's what was that. That was what was so great about this music. It was completely dangerous. There was no rules. This next song's off our last album, it's called Menace to Mankind. This is what, uh, uh, I guess you could word is society labels people like you, people like me, just because they happen to like a different music. It doesn't matter what you look like, it's just the fact that you listen to this, I don't know, whatever type you want to call it. So anyway, it's uh, Menace to Menace to Mankind.
Well, they were down with the, the scene. They were trying to do something different and uh, they were real. It wasn't like they were fucking one of those bands that just started doing it for the hell of it. They loved the music. I mean, if you l listen to their first and second record, you can hear that, but they also did covers and they, they didn't mind showing people that they were in a different styles of music they weren't just in a you know punk they were in a metal and th they brought their own little twist to it that's what i think is the most special thing about cryptic slaughter they have their own thing so i think if you listen to those records you'll hear that and uh they just fucking kick ass this one is uh by gangrene this one's called alcohol pretty happy-go-lucky guys. We weren't angry, pissed off, punk rock types, really. I mean, <laughs> our image, you know, the music kind of portrayed that, but we were, you know, middle-class kids in Santa Monica. It was a great place to grow up. And we all had really good relationships with our parents for the most part. And that was important too, because they were all very supportive. 
Hi. Hi, how are you? The rest hadn't come yet. They were following behind me, though. Our frustration, of course, we got to take out through the music. All, all, everything that pissed us off, that we, we had a perfect vent for that teen angst um, through, through the music. And that, I think, really paid dividends, not only for us as a band, but also personally. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Faggots. <laughs> we, were, we, we were fun guys. <laughs> We were looking to have a good time, and you know we uh, enjoyed the connections that we made. We really, really, I think, treasured the friendships that we that we had and, and all the fun we got to have. That was the best part about being in a band. We got to meet a lot of great people, got to see a lot of places we wouldn't have seen otherwise, and I wouldn't have traded that experience for anything. You know, I think it was just, it was an amazing way to spend our youth, and I think we all look back on that time with a lot of fondness. <laughs> what did oh, our eyes for? Dirty, rotten imbeciles. Oh. <laughs> we're friends with these guys. Yeah, these guys are. Good. And these guys, too. Turn around, Rob. We know him, too. These guys, too. They got a skateboard. <laughs> we know him, too. We know Gumby. <laughs> we got an album coming out in about a month. Oh, really? On Death Records. And we're going to tour this summer. Uh, where, where are you Not going? Really. We're going to go, <laughs> yes, we're gonna go up to, to San Francisco and Berkeley and Guerneville. <laughs> and maybe we'll go to the Guerneville. What kind of car do you people have? I drive the Cutlass Supreme Oldsmobile or Family Mobile. He goes to SMC and I go, yeah. him and I go to Samuel High. I'm going to Samuel High. He's lying. I go to alternate <laughs> school for flakes. And he goes to Venice High. My report card looks like the alphabet. <laughs> I was probably the oldest. I, was, I don't know, probably 20 something, but they're like Scott might have been 15. 15. Scott was 15. The other guys were probably 17, maybe 18 at the most. I don't know. Les was 18. He was 19 then. Yeah, Les, Les was 19. And, you were teens. And I, you know, I think Rob, wasn't Rob the last one to come in? I don't yeah, know if I'm right. Was. Rob was the last guy, but I thought. One thing I noticed when he came into the band, it was like the perfect final touch to that band. I think yeah, the first time we played Ruthie's, we were a three-piece. Yeah, and they, the, the, which was crazy too. That showed you how fucking nuts they were. Like they went up there as a three-piece, and and they did that shit. And it, you know, that's that shows that they wanted to play that. They didn't give a fuck. You know, I remember when Rob finally joined the band, that that kind of like solidified them as a unit, and then they just fucking went crazy from that point on, and the rest is history. Fuck you. When I was a kid, you know, my three favorite bass players were, uh, you know, Cliff Burton, um, Dan Loker from SOD, and Rob Nicholson. And what I loved, what Rob did was, you know, he played it, played it tight, you know, to 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 the to the beat. And but like at the end of like, you know, every once in a while, at the end of a measure, he just throw in one of these awesome fucking licks, you know. And I love that, man. And you know that that really like influenced me as a bass player, you know, and how, how I would approach things. This next one's a, a new one. TDL. It should be on our uh, TDL. album. TDL. The next album should be out uh, next month, actually in August. It's gonna be called Stream of Consciousness. And this this new one's called Aggravate, and it's about you know self-explanatory. <laughs>
Hoover Park, or some people called it Hoover Hall, was a gymnasium at a park in the heart of South Central LA. Now, in the mid 80s, the South Central was at the highlight of the Blood Crips War. But we would go down there and promoters would put on shows and rent the place out and Cryptic play there, I think three or four times. But it was a great place to play because there was no bouncers, you could have fun, no one was getting hurt, but the crowd was right on top of you. Like, you had people on the stage, you had people right in the front, and playing there, that was like our home base. And it made us a better band by playing there because you had just a simple PA and the fans were there. And if you, you know, you were killing it, they would let you know. And if you sucked, they would let you know. But luckily with Cryptic, when we play there, every time was a great show. People singing, stage diving, you know, huge pits. And to play there with bands like Vermock, Terrorizer, and... It just made us a better band when we went on tour because we honed in how we would play in front of a, a crowd like that and it was just a great time to be in the crossover thrash scene. This next song is on our first album. The song is called Black and White. that's there to discover this stuff. And it doesn't matter what, what it is you're into. Um, the, that 80s scene, it, it, was, it was a golden age of thrash, hardcore, um, all that, that stuff that I grew up on. To me, that's still the best era. And I've never heard anything that can even come close. I don't know, it's hard to say what my favorite group of Slaughter song It's definitely going to be off Convicted because that's what I heard first and it left such an impact on me. MAD, I guess, I mean, it's, or, or Low Life, you know, those are classics, but uh, one of those two for sure, I would definitely have to go with that. And uh, everything about the records, though, and the band and the lyrics, the, the political lyrics and the punk influences there, and all, it's all great. Uh, my favorite Cryptic Slaughter song is probably Money Talks. Um, I love the lyrics and like any other Cryptic Slaughter song or record, uh, it's just super, super fast. Uh, it pushes the envelope as far as speed goes. And, um, you know, it goes from fast to great mosh parts back to fast. And, uh, yeah, Money Talks.
tour stories. You know, I do interviews still for Cryptic, and a lot of the questions I get asked was like, what was it like touring with Cryptic back in the days? First thing you gotta remember, it's, it's the late 80s. So it wasn't like we had a tour bus. We had a van, a panel van that we rent from U-Haul and less disconnected the speedometer on it. So we never knew how fast we were going, but we had to do that so they wouldn't know how far we drove because we told them we were only going a short distance. We were thinking Kentucky and we had our roadie merch guy, Jason Charles with us, who's an old friend from high school. And he's looking out the side window of the panel van and he's waving you know, Les is driving, Bill's in the back, Rob's shoot, sitting shotgun, and I'm going, dude, why are you, who are you waving at? He goes, I don't know, man, I think they're probably fans because these cars are waving at us and I'm waving back. And he goes, so that's, I think it's pretty cool. Ratchery says that, all I hear is Bill going, pull the van over, we blew a tire on the U-Haul. And we look out the back and there's fucking sparks shooting down, just shooting fucking high, high as can be. And we don't know how long we were driving with it. And I just remember Les pulling the fucking van over and we all ran out like, just like, holy fuck, what the hell? And we were stuck on the Kentucky highway, I think for like three hours, because you gotta remember this is the time when there was no cell phones. And we were just sitting out there just laughing our ass and, we have a picture of it. You see the picture of me, Bill, and Mike from Anchor Watt like pointing at the tire, and it was fucking hilarious. That that that's my favorite tour memory. This is a little off the record, but it's on the record since it's being filmed. Uh, you know, like we we hung out a lot, and I was actually fortunate enough that the guys were always really cool to me too. It's not just that I was cool to them; they were cool to me as also. So I'm humbled by that. But you know. They would invite me to parties, and I remember going to their record release party at a house, I think it was Redondo Beach, and having a good time and drinking beer and eating food. But the, my favorite moment was actually, in the early days, their first trip to San Francisco. We all went up there, and we, Hyrax wasn't even playing. I just went up to have fun with them and Excel. I think it was... Uh, Cryptic Slaughter and Excel, and I think also Attitude Adjustment. Attitude, Attitude Adjustment. Fucking crazy show, all right? It's like three of my favorite bands all playing together. So Ruthie's in. The show was fucking awesome. I remember just being like stoked that LA had actually released some bands that could actually hang with that scene up there because San Francisco had great bands also, so it was nice. But I remember after the show, we went back to this house. I think it was like Concord or some shit, you know, a little bit further outside of San Francisco. But we went to this house and we were all partying and the parties never ended. Like those fucking parties would be from whatever time you got back to the house until whoever would be the last man standing or pass out. But I remember during the party when we finally tried to calm down and go to sleep, there was, I think there was a pinball machine in the room and there's bodies everywhere. It's Cryptic Slaughter, Excel and me and we're just fucking hammered drunk and we're like, basically stage diving even before we're trying to get to bed so there's like people you hear that the pinball machine clinking and like we're flying and there's pillows flying and it just it was a great moment just because it was like we were like a weird family just these guys just hanging out they, they had a great show it was the first time they'd ever played the bay area and i'll never forget partying with those guys at that house you know you, you just don't forget moments like that it was just it was boys being boys good times you guys are great tonight. I want to thank you all. Okay, this next song is, uh, this next song has to do with the, uh, shuttle pilots. This one's called American Heroes.
the Wehrmacht guys at uh, Ruthie's Inn in Berkeley, the first time we ever played with them, in July of 1986, about three weeks before Convicted came out. And it was a great show. We'd never seen each other play before. We never met each other before. And about six months later, they brought us up to Portland for the first time. We played up there, and it was an incredible experience for us. And after that show, Portland really became our home away from home. We really felt like that scene and that city embraced us as, as well as any other city we'd ever been in, including our own hometown. It was always a party with the Vermont guys, and they were on a whole different level of debauchery than we were. We, we were choir boys compared to those guys, <laughs> seriously. <laughs> we could not compete with, with what they brought to the table, but we were willing to learn. <laughs> And, you know, as soon as we got off the plane, the whole time we were in Portland, every time we went to Portland, they made sure we knew this is how it's going to be. You're on our turf now. You, you're playing by our rules. And, you know, it was that way the whole time. And uh, we loved it. And we loved those guys. Another tour story um, was when we were coming back from the Canadian border after we found out that all our Canadian shows were canceled. And so we we're going from Canada to the United States. And, you know, they pull us over and say, say you know, we got to inspect the van. And we're like, okay, no big deal. So they have us in this room. It's us and Anchor Watt. And we're just hanging out. And then the border guys come in. They go, which one of you is Scott Peterson? And I raise my hand. I go, I'm Scott Peterson. Why? And he goes, oh, are you the guy with the white substance in his bag? And I'm like, no. And everyone starts laughing because... I'm the straight edge guy. You know, why would I have white substance? And he goes, I go, no, you probably have the wrong bag. He goes, no, you, your girlfriend's name is Jackie, right? And I go, yeah. And he goes, yeah, so you have the Thrasher skate bag that has the white powder in it. And what it was at that time, my girlfriend gave me a gift because I was going on tour of a pitcher wrapped with body powder. And the border guys thought it was cocaine. So they basically tore our whole van apart, tore all our shit out of our bags, and we, they let us go, but we had to go back into our van and put every, find out whose clothes was what, and it was just terrible, but it was still a funny moment. I, I still laugh about when I think of it. All right, this next song's our last song. It's called Could Be Worse.
to me, you know, it'll always be a relevant thing because um, it kind of bridged the gap for metal and hardcore for me and bands that do that that can be a piece of each and, uh, you know, kind of bring these two worlds together, that's an important thing. I, I was into metal first, I was into hardcore later and bands like Cryptic Slaughter and DRI were the ones that brought me into hardcore. So um, when I look back at how I kind of morphed into going through the bands I was listening to and learning to play the drums and uh, just kind of how I developed as a musician and how these bands came into play to make me, uh, you know, bring me where I'm at now and uh, my whole catalog of, of music that I'm a fan of. Um, and then I compare that against kind of heavy metal of today. Um, you know, I, I think bands like Cryptic Slaughter and DRI and, and uh, paired up with, you know, other California bands, I think they congeal to make this one great package that has, uh, has made me what I am today as far as a music fan. Comparing that to music today, a lot of bands sound the same. The production value is the same. Um, the, the kind of structural parts of the songs are kind of the same. Not saying that, that that's bad, you know, that's just the state of music today. Whereas back, uh, back then, each band kind of had its own trademark sound, it had its own trademark logo, um, there was this mystery and everything that, that was just the package of the band, you know, it stood out more. Good music, 29 years later, stands the test of time. And, you know, there's been a shitload of bands, and whenever your name still stays above the fray, like if, you know, you get mentioned in the top five or top ten, you've done a damn good job. And I think really what it comes down to is the music, you know, you know, these kids that are still getting introduced to Cryptic Slaughter are learning about great music. So that's, I think that's what keeps fueling it, you know, and, and people spread the word because once they get a hold of these records, they're like, they want to share it with other people. So I think it's going to be more, more years to come. There'll be another 29 years and we'll probably all be fucking dead, but there'll still be kids listening to Cryptic Slaughter. <laughs> okay, this next one is written for and dedicated to the PMRC. Yeah, I, I guess you probably all know who the PMRC are. In case anyone doesn't, they're the people. Uh, somehow, they decided that they had the right to uh, put labels on music that they found offensive. I mean, they found offensive. These are people that like, I guess, the radio in the country of Western. Anyway, our next song to them is what's called Freedom of Expression.
amazing thing to me is that I never imagined people would still be listening to Cryptic Slaughter 30 years later. I never ever thought that it would still there would still be an audience for it. And in some ways we're more popular now than we were then. And we haven't played a show together since 1988. <laughs> for me, Cryptic Slaughter was, you know, one of the first bands that, that like really influenced me to, you know, to, to, to play fast, you know, and, and kind, of, kind of opened a door for me to, to get into like, you know, fa even faster stuff, you know, like, you know, blast beat, grindcore kind of shit, you know. I wouldn't have got there, you know, if, if Cryptic Slaughter hadn't, hadn't like, you know, showed me the way, you know, to, to, you know, and definitely led me to become the musician I am today, you know. Well, there's bands out there that are influenced. I mean, Hate Breed is a crossover band just like, you know, and here we are however many years later, and we might be doing it to different styles, but it's all crossover at the end of the day, and that's that was important back then to bring the scenes together, which is what we try to do. So it's very influential on us in that aspect. And also, you know, you have bands like Toxic Holocaust, Municipal Waste, you can hear that, you know, I'm sure they'll cite you. Cryptic Slaughter is an influence, and, you know, it's, I just think it's important that, that kids, even if, even if they can't relate to it now or it's, it's just, it's, you know, it's a different time, I get it, but to go back and check it out for sure. I and mean, bands, like you said, DRI, Nuclear Assault, SOD, the bands that were really crossing over from the hardcore scene to the metal scene back then, even Agnostic Front and, and, and bands like that. So I think it's, it's very important and definitely relevant to this day. Okay, this next song is an old one. It's an old one, but a goodie. It's not the first album. This one's called New Clear Future.
fans are like the most hardcore, devoted, diehard, to the bone motherfuckers I've ever met in my life. I'm, I'm serious. I'm, I'm constantly blown away by the devotion and the dedication of our fans. And we weren't for everybody. I know that. You know, people loved or hated us. There was no middle ground. And that's fine. That's the way we wanted it. But the fact that these guys are still hardcore 30 years later and their kids are now <laughs> on board, it just blows me away. You know, like, I don't have a whole lot of tattoos. So, uh, like, I'm kind of picky about what I get. And, you know, I was, like, looking for something to put on this arm. And, and I was going, you know, through my old record collection and uh, came across this. And I was like, ah, what, what would be cool off of this, man? And this little hatchet guy right here came up and I was like, perfect, man. So I took it over to my tattoo guy. Came out fucking pretty killer, I think. <laughs> Gene Simmons, you know, Rob Nicholson, two of my favorite bass players. So there you go. <laughs> the first time I heard of Cryptic Sonata was about 1986, when a friend of mine bought the cassette for Money Talks, and I got Strumbeat right away. Knew it was just going to be an amazing CD, and it was. Well, we chose Cryptic Sonata for glorious times just because they're one of the great old school bands that crossed over. And the, and the metal, hardcore, death metal, thrash, everyone loved Cryptic Slaughter back then. And just, they fit perfectly. Scott, Les, Rob, Bill, Cryptic Slaughter. Just want to say thank you for the 30 plus years of music and even more so your friendship. It has affected my life in ways that I can't even put into words. From being a teenager going to the Fender shows, uh, Hoover Recreation Center, the Balboa, going on tour with you guys in 1988, and continuing to this day working on all the reissues, this CD, DVD, documentary. I just want to say thank you for everything. and. I'm humbled and grateful for having cryptic slaughter in my life. Love you.
It all, it all, you know, basically what we're trying to say, it all boils down to being yourself. Being, you know, having a negative attitude. You know, that's alright for some. But to me, having a negative attitude, just everything looks bad. Um, a lot of things are bad, but if you gotta think a little bit positive, you gotta make your life just a little bit better. And you gotta be happy with it. Because it's the only life you got. This is called Positively. fact that I'll still have people coming up to me and saying, you know, that, that record changed my life when it came out, or that record stopped me from making a, a horrible mistake. Uh, when people express those kind of life-changing moments to you, it really takes everything that we did to another level. Because, yeah, playing and touring and, and selling records and, and having fun, that's, that's great. But when you have a deep effect on someone's life, it's like it really makes you think that what we did made a difference, e even if it was just for a few people. And that means more than all the record sales in the world. It really does. And I'm incredibly humbled by those stories and by the people that we've, that we've touched. And I wouldn't change it for anything. Best experience I've ever had. This one's gonna be our last one tonight. This one's got low life.
We gotta make room for the other bands.